let's do that too. Um, it may not feel like it, but we actually have been taking our time thus far when it comes to adding these reactions because we've only added about three new reactions so far, right? Um, we're going to do that just, we're probably going to surpass that today. Um, I think we have four or five new reactions for alkenes on today's um, on today's lecture. The good news is that they're they're all related to similar mechanisms to what we've seen before, or at least there are some similarities. Um, halogenation and hydrogenation in particular have a couple differences as to how they work. Um, but uh, we're going to see a lot of a lot of similarities again. So we're just going to keep going and keep adding new ways of of breaking that pi bond and rearranging and the the atoms that are left and then we add. So it's still, still going to be addition reactions at this point. Um, we're just giving ourselves more options for these addition reactions. Um, let's see. Well, since the the two of you who asked the most the most relevant off-topic questions are both here. Um, we can talk about these a little bit. Um, so the first question is, is a very complicated question. What's you know what's the deal with addiction? Um, basically, that there's and that's that's a really complicated question to ask because it's it's tied to your genetics and your brain chemistry at any given point. Um, and so it's not, not just that somebody, um, you know, really likes to smoke cigarettes. There is a physical component to that that's tied to the neurotransmitters in your brain. And almost always um, real physical addiction is tied to dopamine and endorphin levels in the brain. Um, so depending on what you, you know, every time you do something that releases dopamine in your brain, that's basically your brain's way of training you to do that again. Um, it seems weird that your brain would train you or train itself. Um, but that, you know, when you finish something and you get that flood of dopamine in your system, even if it's a small amount, that's basically telling you, hey, that was good. Let's do that again. Um, and so when you get a dopamine rush from something like finishing a task, you're training yourself to do that task again. But when you get a dopamine hit from something like, um, you know, smoking a nicotine cigarette or drinking alcohol, you're, tr you're training your body to drink more alcohol or smoke more cigarettes. Um, and so the more you do that, the more ingrained it becomes, the harder it is to basically break that cycle and do and not do that. And that's why you, see, you do see um, people that, that um, manage to, to break an addiction almost always typically, or almost always replace it with something else that they can be addicted to that's more socially acceptable or that's better for them. So people, recovering addicts frequently become somewhat addicted to exercise. Um, or things, things of that nature, or why, you know, you break one addiction and, you know, but you can't break that cigarette addiction. You break, you know, hard drugs addiction because that's clearly going to ruin your life. But cigarettes are bad for you, but are not as likely to ruin your life. So you keep that. So you still have that, that addiction as, a, as that is sort of helping you bridge the gap of going, you know, so you're not going cold turkey, so to speak. Um, so it's it's definitely has to do with with the genetics as well because different people are susceptible to different kinds of addiction as well. Um, people who have a certain brain chemistry to start might be more predisposed to develop an addiction to stimulants versus depressants, for instance. Um, not everybody's just as susceptible to getting addicted to opioids. Everybody can get addicted given enough time. But it's gonna be it's gonna happen more quickly for some people than others, depending on on their genetics and and past experiences. Um, I thought the second question was a good question because we are dealing with uh, we need to become familiar these days with how we disinfect things. So seventy percent isopropyl alcohol versus ninety one percent isopropyl alcohol. 
those are those are just like ABV in in uh, alcoholic beverages. It's just the alcohol percentage by volume. So seventy percent isopropyl alcohol means that seventy that there's seventy milliliters of isopropyl alcohol for every hundred milliliters of the solution. Um, so it and the other the remaining is um, thirty percent is made up of water predominantly, maybe a couple of other things here or there, um, some impurities. But for the most part, it's going to be 70% isopropyl alcohol, 30% water, or 91% isopropyl alcohol, 9% water. Um, and all the isopropyl alcohol really is doing is it basically just denatures the proteins and breaks up cell membranes of anything um, that you spread it on. So that's why it's bad for your skin as well. We just have multiple layers of skin to protect us from environmental toxins like like isopropyl alcohol and things like viruses and bacteria don't have that those multiple layers of protection so we're denaturing our own cells as well but it's less harmful for us um, than it is for things like viruses i actually got my coffee made this morning and it's quite wonderful i like having my coffee in the morning Um, and then random personal question I'll, I'll address quickly. So what's my favorite intersection of OCHEM and biology as, under, as an undergrad? Um, well, I have two answers. One is before I started acting like an adult, and mainly I just liked OCHEM because I got to be condescending towards the biology majors. Um, but then, you know, once I started acting like an adult, I realized that biochemistry is really just one giant interconnected system of equilibrium reactions. Um, and they all have, they also follow the same rules of equilibrium from Gen Chem. You know, you've got products over reactants, but except you have, you know, tens of thousands of equilibrium reactions that are all in equilibrium at any given point in your body, in every cell of your body. Um, and every one of those reactions you can describe using OCHEM, and then you can predict, you know, reaction rates by looking at enzyme kinetics. Um, and so I, I really find that really fascinating, just how large of a system all that you have to do to describe biochem really pretty comprehensively is take OCHEM in equilibrium and scale it up, um, which I think is really cool. They, and that, that's why things like organic medications are, are so effective and affect so many different parts of the body is because all, you change one thing here, everything else changes too. Um, as far as questions that are more relevant to the class, um, somebody asked about sin and anti, and is it safe to say they're the same as saying cis and trans? And the answer is not quite. They're, they're related. Sin and cis are both referring to things that are on the same side of, of a molecule. The difference is cis is talking about a molecule at the at the end, a product or a reactant, where you're saying, okay, in this molecule, I have these two pieces of the molecule are pointed the same direction. The difference is that sin is saying, oh, in the course of this reaction, I'm adding things to the same side of the molecule. As, regardless of where things started or ended, it's whatever I'm adding has to be on the same side of the molecule. And since a lot of our addition reactions, we're adding a hydrogen to one side or the other, and hydrogen is, we're never talking about hydrogen as being cis or trans, because hydrogen is always our lowest priority, right? So cis and trans is, is more referring to the molecule itself at the end, versus sin and anti referring to how are we changing the molecule. So it's more about the process rather than what you started with or what you ended with, which I get is a very subtle distinction, but it but that's the reason why we have these two different terms is so that we can distinguish between we do an anti-addition to make a cis product, which seems counterintuitive, but when one of the things you're adding is a hydrogen, that's what we see a lot. And that's actually what we saw in the quiz. 
Um, so let me pull up the quiz and we'll look at it. And I be believe it was question three that had the ring structure. It had cyclo dimethyl cyclohexene. And we saw a, a syn addition, which resulted in tr a trans product. Let's see, there they are. All right, just so we're all on the same page here. We've got one, two, dimethyl cyclohexene reacting in an oxymercuration, demercuration with ethyl, ethyl amine. And if you go and you and you double check your notes and double check the the uh, textbook, this reaction always does a, always acts in an, now I'm second guessing myself. I believe it's a sin addition. Um, and that, so that sin addition means that we're going to, if we attack from the top, we're going to attach the nitrogen to one of these carbons. And we're going to attach a hydrogen to the other one of these carbons on the same side of the ring. So if the nitrogen's attached above the ring, that means that our hydrogen will also be attached above the ring. Um, and actually, I have the key on here, which, um, do you guys see that, that for some of these, I had the key loaded with a quick explanation of why? Was that helpful? Did anybody notice that that was on there? Um, some of the questions was supposed to give you some feedback um, and it might have been helpful. Let me just go to the key here since that way I don't have to redraw it and I know that I will get the answer right. Um, so it's only anti addition. I did have it backwards, so I'm glad I checked. All right, so we are going to add the amine and then we add the hydrogen to the opposite side. And so we have only anti-addition, which means we actually wind up with the nitrogen and the adjacent methyl group being pointed the same direction. So anti-addition led to the cis product in terms of where the methyl group is relative to the nitrogen. Right, so that's that's really why we have those two different terms because they're talking about two different things. They're just using similar language to discuss that. So, and, John, just yeah. from that key, I guess I'm still kind of confused when you want us to show, um, like, if it's coming at us or away from us um, on that problem specifically. I didn't do that. So I'm wondering is if you, why would we show that in that instance? Why would we differentiate the direction? If if switching them would make give you a different molecule, then you need to show both that uh, which direction things are going to be facing. So for instance, you could have for this reaction, you could have wound up with the we have the nitrogen there, methyl group, methyl group. If you made this molecule versus having the both methyl groups pointed the same direction. So the methyl groups, the right answer in this one has the methyl groups are always going to be trans relative to each other. And so that's why we need to show which direction they're pointing because we're not going to get both versions of the molecule. We're only going to get one version of that molecule. And that's with the two methyl groups pointed the opposite direction from each other. And then the mirror image of this would be if the nitrogen ap approached from the top, we would wind up with the nitrogen pointing out towards us, the second methyl pointing towards us, and the first methyl pointing away from us. Uh, 
So these two molecules are mirror images of each other. So we have the we have enantiomers, but we're not going to get the diastereomers. We're not get the, going to get the version where the methyl groups are pointed the same direction. All right. So it's these ones are are tricky details to be paying attention to, and the. A lot of times I had to go back and double check because somebody asked a question about um, about you know if if it seems like we're only given one stereoisomer to start with, like I didn't say it show any stereochemistry here. So how do you, how would you guys know that you needed to add these? Well, the reason I don't have to show any stereochemistry when I give you dimethylcyclohexene is because the the alkene group is planar, so it doesn't have stereochemistry. It doesn't have R and S, but once you break that pi bond and you turn carbon one and carbon two into um, into tetrahedral geometries, now we do have R and S, and we need to be paying attention to it. So when you do addition reactions, we will frequently add stereochemistry, and you have to, and you need to be paying attention to that with these addition reactions specifically because you're going from planar to tetrahedral, which makes things more complicated, makes things 3D instead of 2D. So, um, although for instance, since those are enantiomers, would we only have to draw one of them? If you drew one of them and then put plus enantiomer? Yeah, that or would put, be good. Drew one of them and then said R and S or something like that, that's, that's fine. Yeah. As long as you're, you're showing me that, um, you're not going to get there. There are really four different stereo or stereoisomers here, right? Because you could have there are R and S when you have the two methyls trans, and then there's R and S when you have the two methyls cis. And we're not going to get the two where the two methyls are cis relative to each other. So drawing one of these and saying plus the enantiomer would be the, the best way to do, or just to draw both of them. Um, I'm, I'm confused. Why would we have to draw the enantiomer? Sorry, I know we're regressing a little bit back to last quarter, but um, couldn't you just look at that and realize that if, you know, if you looked at the mirror image that it would be the same molecule? Would it be though? So let's, let's draw it and then see if we can flip one of them into the other. So I'm going to draw it with a, a vertical no. mirror plane. No, you're right. No, you wouldn't. They'd be, yeah, they'd be a little bit different because to try and, but I, you're not the only one who has had questions about this. So I don't mind redoing this real quick. Um, if I just draw the um, mirror image, let's see, I had it facing that way. So those are mirror images of each other, right? Mm -hmm. But if you took the one on the right and tried to spin it around to make it look like the one on the left, if you flipped it like a pancake, then you wind up with the nitrogen pointing up instead of down. And if you flipped it, flipped it a different way to try and make the nitrogen still facing down, you wind up with the nitrogen on the on this carbon instead of the other carbon. So there's no way you could take the molecule on the right and rotate it to make it look like the molecule on the on the left. Okay, maybe I'm getting my enantiomers and diantiomers confused, probably. Yeah, and if you if you think about another way of phrasing a question, or if you if you have it, uh, if you want to ask a question during break or in office hours too, okay. um, I don't mind going through this again because it is tricky. Okay. Um, all right, let's look at. Um, pretty much all of you guys got the hydrobromination, right? The acid catalyzed bromination, Markovnikov addition. You're just adding a BR to the more substituted carbon. Um, and most pretty much all of you guys got one and two correct as well. Uh, trying to see if there was anything that really the only other thing that really tripped you guys up on the reactions was um, a couple of people didn't miss that this was ethanol, so you were adding an ethoxy group, not an OH. And then um, you did wind up making 
two different enantiomers here as well. You wind up with the R and the S. You wind up making a stereo center where you've got the ethoxy group attached to carbon two. So I was looking for you to either draw both versions or say R and S mixture or something along those lines. Um, and it's not missing the stereochemistry here on the reactant because it doesn't have a stereo center in this point, right? Carbon three has two methyl groups attached that are identical, so there's no R versus S there. Carbon or the alkene doesn't have a cis versus trans because you've got two hydrogens attached to carbon one, so you couldn't tell the difference anyway if you switched those two hydrogens. But when you do the addition, we make a stereo center because now all of a sudden we have four different things attached to this to carbon two. Carbon three is still fine. But carbon two, we now have R versus S, and that we're going to get them in um, equal amounts, right? Because we have an equal probability of adding our eth oxide pointed out towards us or into the board away from us. Um, the other thing is, pay attention when I'm when I ask for mechanisms. That means I want all the steps, and this was a long one. I wanted you guys to get some practice with this. Um, and so, and remember that these quizzes, I expect you guys to be checking your notes or checking the textbook for this. So you can go back and, um, hopefully leave yourself, you have left yourself enough time to, before you have to submit this to go back and, and do this. And this one, um, you did have three or two different points where it was repetitive or did the same thing three times in a row. I'm fine with you showing it once and then saying, and then it happens two more times. Um, you just have to, to say that. Don't just make the assumption that you show one step and then jump to it happened three times. You just have to say time, you know, two more times or everything in parentheses times three and then show what the product with that of that would be. All right. Any any other questions on the quiz itself at this point? Not necessarily about the quiz, but um, I thought I caught you say something about anti-addition usually leads to trans configuration. Is that, did I hear that right? They, are, they mean similar things. So my daughter hooked all of my dry erase pens together. So I just threw them all over the floor because I tried to pick up one and I picked up four of them. Um, so if we have, let's stop the screen share here. Yeah, that's kind of hard to see. If we have a pi bond, It's, we're going to add something to each side. So let's say that this is our cyclohex um, hexene. So let's just call that R and call this a methyl group. So it's flat right here. And anti-addition means that when we break this up, we're going to add one thing above where the pi bond was and the other thing below where the pi bond was. And so if that means that we're going to take this and we're going to add to the, let's say we added it to the left side, we added our nitrogen group. The other side, we're going to add, if it's an anti-addition, that means that we're going to add our hydrogen below. So if, if one of the things that we're adding is a hydrogen, then yes, anti-addition will lead to a cis product a lot of time because we're not usually talking about where is the hydrogen when we're using terms like cis and trans. We're usually talking about where the bigger groups are. Because then it, once we, if we redraw this, we wind up with something where the where the nitrogen we added and the methyl that was already there are pointed the same direction. 
So these two are cis relative to each other. But the addition was anti because the two things that we added were on opposite sides. Okay. Again, and it's a subtle difference, but there's a reason why we we have all these different terms for describing um, spatially where things are. And so we use them to describe things just a little bit differently. Um, when doing hydroboration oxidation, how do we know if it's a sin addition? So this goes along with that question. One, you can check the um, you can check the mechanism in the textbook and it'll tell you. The other thing way you can do it is if you know what the mechanism is, it kind of you can kind of see that it, it makes sense. So let's say we've got methyl propene. And we'll draw it in the same orientation again this way, where the pi bond, the pi bond is flat in the board. So we have uh, all right, so let's say we're starting with this molecule and we're going to go through hydroboration. The first step in hydroboration, if you remember, was that we needed to, we're going to basically do a transfer two pairs of electrons at the same time. And the boron comes and adds above the less sterically hindered side. I, I drew methyl butene instead of methyl propene, but it still works for this example. I just said the name incorrectly. Um, so if we have there are two other hydrogens, hydrides attached to boron, but here's the one that's going to be added. See what I'm dealing with here? So then the, the mechanism is going to look like this for that first step. So we're actually going to get a syn addition for the first step of the hydrogen and the boron adding at the same time because they're both we're breaking this bond and breaking this bond at the same time. So they have to be coming from the same direction. You can't have the hydride coming up from below if the boron's up here. So these two add, this is a syn addition step. But then once you have that, that molecule rearranged. So let's we've broken this. We've added our new bond here. And then our next step would, would be that the, an oxygen has to come in here. So I, well, the next real next step would be that happens two more times. So we have BR2 attached here. And then we're going to wind up with the same, a similar reaction happening, right? Because the next step was, okay, then we attach this unstable o, OOH group to the brom to the boron. And we have to do something really similar where we wind up with the electrons the electrons from the boron oxygen bond wind up, or the boron carbon bond switch over the oxygen, the second oxygen takes the, ox the electrons with it. And, but then this one could really be happening from either side, right? This step is not, does not have to be a sin it's not really addition at all. Let me zoom in. Right, because this boron is now tetrahedral, right? Which means this oxygen could be 
could be attacked by the carbon bond from either direction. And so it's not, this step is not as stereo specific. Um, because once we move this carbon over to the oxygen, that could have happened from either side. So the first step was a sin addition. The second step, though, is less stereo specific. Right, so the the answer, the original question was, how do we know if it's sin addition versus um, versus a anti addition? If you look at the mechanism, if it happens in two two steps, if the addition happens, okay, I add something to one side, and then something comes in and, and does it's like an SN two, it does a backside attack from the opposite side of the molecule. That's going to give you an anti addition. But if you have something where you need the where the hydrogen and the boron both have to be added at the same time, it's going to be syn addition. Right, so it, we just have to pay attention to the mechanisms when we're doing this. And that's going to help us remember which of these are. The other way you can you can double check it since this is when things are open book um, is you can Google hydroboration sin versus anti and the first thing that comes up i think if you do that is um uc davis's libra text on on uh, organic chemistry it's also in your textbook it goes through this as well um but if you just if you're just filling out the reaction page and you can't remember if this was supposed to be sin or trans or anti just double check it um you can usually work if you have the mechanism down you can usually work backwards to figure out if it's sin or anti, um, but it's not always faster to do that necessarily. All right. So if we're looking at um, somebody else asked what finishes the addition reaction during a nucleophilic attack, um, that's usually going to be whatever nucleophile you have around, right? If you change up the nucleophile in, say, oxymercuration, that's what gives you we're attaching an ethoxy group instead of an, an OH group. It just whatever the nucleophile is that's around is going to be what you add second usually to most of these addition reactions. We'll see another, a couple more options for what they could be here in um, in a few minutes. Um, this one's and this we talked about stereochemistry as well. Um, it's I didn't copy the whole question. It's basically. Um, if I don't give you a specific stereoisomer and that that affects which stereoisomer you get at the end, then you should assume that you're going to get a mixed product. But generally speaking, I'm trying to be very careful with how I draw your reactants. And But just with addition reactions, you run, it's a common wrinkle to add a stereo center. We frequently see that happening unless we're adding something with that's the same on both sides or we are adding something in the new tetrahedral carbons don't have any stereo chemistry um so it's just one of those things you need to pay attention did i make an asymmetric center when this reaction happened if you did and you and you have an equal probability of attacking from pop, top and bottom you're going to get an equal mixture of r and s and that's just that's just something to pay attention to for that for the full credit. That's you know a quarter of a point off. You know, if you if you got a, the entire reaction right but you forgot to write plus an antiomer, that's not that's the equivalent of a sig fig error in in ochem is forgetting that there was supposed to be an extra 
to plus an antimer in there and under most circumstances. Um, so just be paying attention. That should always be running through the back of your head. Did I make a new stereo center? If so, did I make just one or is there multiple options? The quickest ones are the ones where you get to answer that question. No, I didn't make a new stereo center because then you don't need to worry about it. If the answer is yes, and you're starting with something that's planar, usually you're going to wind up making both versions of it, the R and the S, because you have an equal probability of attacking from each side. <clears throat> so when in doubt, if you think, well, I made a new stereo center and I'm not sure, just write plus EN. And most of the time, you're going to be right if it's an addition reaction. All right, let's do one that's kind of tricky to visualize. This is a real compound. This is called alpha pinene, um, which incidentally is one of the primary flavor compounds in hops. Um, any, any hops that you have tasted in a beer or smelled before and it smells really piney, like a pine tree, um, alpha pinene, very creatively named, is the, the compound that's responsible for that usually. Um, and it is fairly complex to look at. It's two ring structures on top of each other. You basically have two cyclohexenes that are fused. So try and draw this. See if you can draw this in a way that makes sense. It might even be an advantageous to look it up on mole view. That's not super helpful, but if you look at the 3D version of it. Where'd my double bond go? There it is. Right, so you have a cyclohexene that's got an extra bridging carbon across. So if you thought drawing cyclohexanes was hard, when back when we had to do chair versus boat confirmation, this is this one's even trickier. In fact, I'm not going to even use the dashes because that's going to get even trickier. So if it was a cyclohexane, cyclohexane that was bridged like this, you could draw it like it's the chair conformation and just link two of the corners together. This is cyclohexene, not hexane, which means we have a planar one back there, which, which means 
it gets a little bit more complicated even. So this is a pi bond. And let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So I'm trying to redraw this instead of just copying what's on there. But basically, you've got this flat hexagon that then has this bridge between two corners of it. And that bridge happens to have two methyls on them on it. All right, so that's the one that's sticking up. And then we had a methyl coming out towards us that was attached to the pi bond here. So then the question becomes, and let's see if I can draw this in just a straight line, just to not make it look like there's an extra carbon there. And that one just has a hydrogen attached to the far side there. So that looks kind of like what's drawn on the on the paper. I'm going to give you another way to visualize it that might be helpful. Draw it as a flat hexagon. Add your pi bond where you need your pi bond and your methyl group attached to your pi bonds. And then you have an extra carbon bridging that, that spot there. So basically, if, if this is a flat hexagon, you then have the extra carbon is sticking out of the board towards us, attaching to these two corners of the hexagon. And realistically, since this is a tetrahedral shape, these are sort of going that other carbon is down into the board. So you almost have like a, almost looks a bit like a, what's that fish that's super flat? Flounder. It almost looks a bit like a flounder with a big mouth at one end and then the rest of the molecule is kind of flat. And then you had the two other methyls sticking up towards us too. And all of this is somewhat academic because, well, it's all very academic, but I meant it doesn't matter for this for the sake of this reaction because the reactive part of the molecule doesn't have this weird bridge structure. So the reactive part of the molecule doesn't matter what else is happening, right? This is good practice for seeing it in 3D, but really we only care about these two carbons. And actually it looks like I did add an extra carbon in here. This one should be connected over here instead. This is connected adjacent to the pi bond. Um, but again, doesn't make a bit of difference because what we really care about, yeah, that's what I did is I connected. So it's the mouth is over here. Again, if I have to count past four, then, then I lose track because carbons. But so I would actually be connected here, but the same same general shape we were just talking about. But these are the only two that matter for the reaction. So if it went through hydroboration, we see hydroboration is anti-Markovnikov, no rearrangement. 
So if it went through hydroboration, we'd make that compound. And almost certainly we're gonna have some stereochemistry involved here, right? So we're gonna wind up making, if we add the hydrogen is going to be added in the cis position to the boron and then the boron is just replaced with the oxygen, we can make it with the oxygen up, which would then make this carbon would be in the trans position. Hey, Sean, do you think you could do this in full screen? Because the red's not showing up on the small screen. Sorry. Thank you. Yes. Let me. And then I can zoom in further. So we started from. here, hydroboration was the first question that was asked, and hydroboration is syn addition, which means your new hydrogen and your new oxygen are on the same side of the molecule. So we break the pi bond. Anti-Markov, Nikov, so our OH goes on the less substituted carbon pointed out towards us. And that means that our, if it's syn addition, that means the new hydrogen that we added is also pointed towards us. So that means that the methyl group is pointed away from us. And enantiomer. Right, because if the oxygen got added on the far side of the ring structure, that means the methyl would then be pointed towards us. And that's not going to be the same molecule. So we're adding a stereo center by doing this. Technically, we're adding two stereo centers, but we're only going to get these two isomers. Right? Because it's syn addition, the methyl is always going to be pointed in the opposite direction as the OH here. Right, because the other thing that was added was the hydrogen when we broke that pi bond. These are pointed the same direction, which means the methyl has to be pointed the opposite direction. Let's do more practice. I'm going to erase the red here and reset this back to the same molecule we started with. Alpha pinene. questions. Okay, if that goes through oxymercuration, Oxymercuration was the anti addition, and it follows Markovnikov's rule. <laughs> 
All right, so we're going to be attaching an OH. Here's our nucleophile. We're attaching an OH to the more substituted carbon, but in an anti-addition. So if we start by adding the hydrogen facing up, the hydrogen pointing out towards us, that means anti-addition means that the other piece of the addition, which is the oxygen, the OH, is going to be added in the opposite direction. Now, the anti versus sin doesn't really make a difference on this one, right? Because we added, there, there was already a hydrogen there on the top carbon. So this isn't a stereo center because you have two identical substituents attached to it. So it didn't really matter that it was anti versus cis, or sorry, anti versus sin for this reaction. Um, we still want to pay attention to it because occasionally it does matter. Or at least we want to be aware of it and be paying attention to it. Hey, Sean, I got a question about that one. Yeah. Uh, just real quick. So you said it was anti addition. Now, are you just, you can assume that right away because it was the oxymercuration, demercuration. I know that you can do that if it's Markov and Nikov. And that's more substituted, but I can assume then the anti-addition because it's oxymercuration, demercuration. Yes, and it winds up being because of the the actual mechanism that intermediate that we formed that has the mercury there. That then we replace the mercury with the OH. The mercury and the hydrogen have to add on opposite sides. They have to be in the anti-addition, and then when we replace the mercury, the oxygen goes into it also in the anti-position. Um, and so because it's oxymercuration, oxymercuration always goes anti. Hydroboration always goes sin. And so it's just, it's a characteristic of that mechanism of this reaction. Great, thank you. Nine times out of 10 is not gonna make a difference, but occasionally if you've got a complicated molecule and we're breaking a pipe on and making it more complicated, we have to be paying attention to it. All right, would we get something different if it was acid catalyzed hydration instead of this? Was there any rearrangement that could happen? Not really, right? Because we broke a pi bond that was right here and put a, put a positive charge that's already on a tertiary carbon, right? So we want to be, if it's acid catalyzed hydration, we want to be paying attention to, could this rearrange to be more stable? And the answer in this case is no, because it's already tertiary, right? So we get the same product, except we get, uh, no, we get both stereoisomers either way because this is planar, so now the OH can attack from either direction once again. So we get plus an antiomer. Or if you just draw it like this and then put R plus S. Probably, probably better have it to be in, to put, be putting plus an antiomer, because that means you have to show the stereochemistry for one of them. So if we drew it like this and then plus EN is a little bit better because that's showing me exactly which stereoisomer we're talking about here. And we're just drawing the skeletal structure. <laughs> 
we don't even need to draw those, right? So it makes it clear this is the stereo center we're talking about. All right. That was pretty intensive review um, and practice. That's where I like to be, though. So let's take our break, 10 minutes, come back at 10 after, and we will add some new reactions. Hey, Sean. Um, can you go over the first one step by step? Because if you said that one's supposed to be bromination, I don't understand how that's bromination, but you end up with adding an OH group. But boration. Boration. I may have misspoken. It is well, hydroboration, not hydrobromination. Well, if it's if it's bro boration, then it shouldn't be adding the brom the boron. But you added an OH. Can you go over it step by step, please? Yeah. So that's the so hydroboration, the first step. So if we started here. Mm -hmm. The first step is we break the pi bond and we wind up with um, our boron being added to the less substituted carbon because it's just physically bigger. So we break the pi bond and I'll draw the new ones in red. It's the syn addition. So we're adding our hydrogen and our boron have to be on the same side. And so then up here, we wind up adding our, it starts as BH2. Mm -hmm. um, and then it does that two more times. You need, you only need um, one one borane for every three of these pinene molecules. Mm -hmm. So we could do that, say that that whole thing happens okay. three times. Okay. And so I'm just going to redraw this with, instead of BH2, it's BR2, where R, And maybe that's where you got the bromine. This is a capital R. Um, not not the bromine, but I thought you wrote OH right there. We're gonna get that. So that's so this is the hydroboration step. The second step is oxidation. Mm -hmm. We then take this and we apply it. The, the second step, the arrow looks like um the second step looks like. Let's see, it's hydrogen peroxide and hydroxide. And what this does is this makes a really strong oxidizing agent, which then is going to come in here and it's basically going to attach an oxygen with this other OH attached to the oxygen to the boron, which gives the boron a negative charge. It's unstable. Mm -hmm. And then basically the OH leaves, take the electrons with it, and these electrons switch over to the oxygen because the oxygen is more electronegative than the boron is. So you okay. go from being B, BR3 to being BOR3. Um, R3 or two? Well, so assuming that this is R, it's gonna then, you've got three of this same molecule attached to the boron. Okay. So you wind up then basically scooting this over. This disappears. And you wind up making you have two other R groups still attached to the boron. But mm -hmm. this one now has an oxygen between the R group and the boron. We basically just inserted an oxygen in between the boron and the carbon. Okay. And then give me a second and then um, we can, we'll finish this in a second, but take, if that then happened three more times, we would have B or two more times. We have B, then O, then R, and we would have it three different times. And I only find the figure in the textbook that shows you in, in more detail than I can fit on my board here. 
mm -hmm. with a less complicated molecule. And you'll see what I mean by R3. Okay. All right, so give me a few minutes though, okay? <laughs> 
All right, let's come on back here and um, for those who wanted to see that mechanism for hydroboration one more time, remember that it's really hydroboration and oxidation. Hydroboration is the, is the first step. Hang on one second. Hydroboration is the first step. That, and that's that sin addition where we wind up adding um, the hydrogen to the more substituted carbon and the boron attaches to the less substituted carbon. Sean, do you mean to be on screen share? I do mean to be on screen share. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So this looks very, so we were dealing with a much larger molecule when we were looking at alpha pinene, but the same first step. You attach the boron to the first. I just watched a big old piece of trash fly by my window, and I have no idea where it came from. Um, you the hydrogen attaches to the more substituted carbon, the boron attaches to the less substituted carbon, and you wind up with this alkyl bor borane, where whatever R group you had, no matter what R was winds up attached so you wind and then you do that two more times and you wind up replacing the three hydrogens on borane with three r groups whatever r is so in the case of alpha pinene r was big bicyclic structure the whole bunch of stereochemistry and carbons attached but it still doesn't change the fact that we're just going to attach three of them to a boron And then the, the oxidation step is the more complicated one. And it goes through, through several steps. The first of which is you have to make this, this hyperox hydroperoxide ion by putting hydrogen peroxide plus hydroxide. You wind up making this HOO with a negative charge, which is super unstable. Peroxides on their own are unstable. Hydroxides on their own are pretty reactive. Both of them in the same molecule are very unstable. Um, and all, the net result is going to be that it sort of inserts itself in between the boron and the carbon. Because boron carbon bonds um, are not as stable as boron oxygen bonds. Right, so you wind up with this secondary, or not secondary, the second step is you make the boron tetrahedral for a second because you attach this hydroperoxide ion to it and then one of your carbons is just going to scoot over to it and you you lose an OH group so you wind up with the net result of that step is you still have all three R groups attached to boron just one of them you inserted in oxygen in between the carbon and the boron okay and then if you do that two more times to the other two groups that have boron attached to carbon still, you wind up with that happening. And so that's why I, I kept saying, you know, mixing up three and two, because I had one of my R groups actually drawn out all the, uh, all the way. And the other one, I was just leaving them as just calling them R. But really, they're all going to be identical in this situation. So it can be helpful to have one of them drawn just so you can remember what your product is going to be and then call the others just R when they're attached just for the sake of um, you know, not taking up too much space. Did that clear up why I had it drawn the way I did a little bit? And then once you do that, once you get to that stage where all of your R groups have oxygen in between the R group and the boron, we still have a bunch of hydroxide around, right? Because each of these steps, we broke a hydroxide off of this molecule to begin with. So we still have a bunch of hydroxide around. Um, and that mean, that hydroxide can then come in here and attach the boron and basically kick off our R groups with the oxygen. So you wind up with your OH comes in here and attaches, an OR group then leaves. And then that 
oxygen can then be protonated. And that's why the, the net result was that we added an OH group, but we had to go through this whole big process of attach a boron where the oxygen is going to be attached eventually. Then your next step was attach the oxygen in between the R group and the boron. And then the third step is kick the R group and, and its oxygen off. And so the net result winds up being you add um, the slides. And I, can, I will attach this to the slides after, um, after class. This was in the slides from last week as well, though. And it's also in the textbook um, on page 364. Um, but I'll pull this figure out and, and add it to, to these slides as well. All right, so again, one of the reasons that I picked this example to do, the alpha pinene example, is because the molecule that you're starting with and the molecule you make are both complicated looking, but the reaction is identical to the other reactions that we've done. You know, the first one was anti Markovnikov, so no, and no rearrangement, only syn addition. And then it's just a matter of, okay, draw what that looks like. And then just, you can just copy the way most of the molecule is drawn because we're only changing that little alkene section of the molecule. All right, so let's go to a simpler mechanism. Um, this next mechanism is called hydrogenation. So different, different than hydration, hydrogenation, instead of adding a water molecule, you're adding hydrogen to both sides. So basically hydrogenation, we're taking an alkene and we're turning it to an alkane. Break the pi bond, add a hydrogen to each side. Right, and it, you need a catalyst for this to happen. Hence why it's called catalytic hydration, or sorry, catalytic hydrogenation. You guys don't need me confusing you more right now. Catalytic hydrogenation. Um, and just like with all these addition reactions, we we're, the net result is break the pi bond, add something to both sides. And the mechanism for this one is one that's it's hard for me to even ask about on a test um, because you have to, this catalyst plays an important role in the mechanism. So we'll go over it. Um, and one of the first things that they realized historically when they were doing this is it's only sin addition. So that means in this case, you get only the cis products, right? Because we're going to add both hydrogens are added to the same side of the molecule. Oh, ow. Sorry, I got a piece of dry erase, dry erase marker dust in my eye. Um, they don't tell you that those dry erase pens are more dangerous than chalk for more reasons than one. All right. So the, what the mechanism actually looks like here, the reason you need a catalyst, and the catalyst can be a lot of things. Platinum is most commonly used because it works really well. Platinum catalyzes a lot of stuff in organic chemistry. Um, but a lot of different metal surfaces can be used here. Because basically what's going to happen is if you expose a metal surface to hydrogen, you wind up with all of your hydrogen molecules sort of sticking to the surface. Um, because remember, hydrogen is more electronegative than metals, right? And so what happens is the metal surface has got an extra electrons. So the hydrogen basically sticks to it and, and tries to steal the electrons from the metal. Um, it's not strong enough to actually oxidize the metal and, and take the electrons from the metal, but it's attracted to them, to those electrons. And so you wind up with this surface that's covered in hydrogen. And then all that happens is whatever your alkene is also 
has a bunch of electrons and those basically um those extra electrons basically get stuck to the surface as well and the hydrogens just sort of glom onto it so this is not one where we can show a whole bunch of of arrows for this mechanism because it's kind of a mess frankly you take this this alkene it sticks to the surface next to all this hydrogen and boom you've got an alkane um and it, but because it's happening on a flat surface, you only get the hydrogens added in the cis addition, or sorry, in the sin addition. It means the same thing in this case. Um, both hydrogens get added to the same side of the molecule, and if that affects your stereochemistry, then that means you're only going to get the versions of the molecule that have um, both of the hydrogens pointed the same direction. Right, so this isn't a mechanism that I would ask you to, to draw the mechanism because there is no drawing. I might ask you a conceptual question like, why does hy catalytic hydrogenation only add in the sin configuration? And you could just say something like, because it's got a flat surface, that's, that's where the reaction is happening. So it always has to be on the same side of the molecule. So and the so we're going to go kind of quick through these and then practice them because these mechanisms are much simpler than the hydroboration. Um, halogenation of an alkene. So not hydrohalogenation. Halogenation means um, we've got the full halogen, so chlorine or bromine, reacting with an alkene. And again, common thread with these addition reactions: you break the pi bond and you add something to both sides. Hydrogenation, you added a hydrogen to both sides. Halogenation, you add, a, you add a halogen to both sides. So hydrohalogenation, you added a hydrogen to one side, a halogen to the other. Pure halogenation, you have, you're adding two halogens to it. Um, and we, only, we don't see this with fluorine, and we don't see this with iodine. Iodine's not reactive enough. Fluorine is way too reactive. If you do this with fluorine, um, then your then your lab explodes. Um, well, probably not the whole lab, but you get an explosion in flying glass and fluorine gas everywhere in your lab, and which none of those are good things. Yeah. Um, so we're only going to see this, and we saw this with the with the hydroalogenation too. We didn't do much with HI or with with HF. Chlorine and bromine are sort of that sweet spot where they're reactive enough but not too reactive um and this one we get only the anti-addition so the hydrogenation we got only the sin because it had to happen on a flat on a flat surface with the halogenation we get only the anti-addition and it's and it's basically because it has to happen in two steps. Um, and so when they're tr first trying to figure out this mechanism, their first thought was that it was going to look something like this, where you start with, okay, your, your bromine, your bromine, um, gets attacked by the alkene electrons. The second bromine just takes the electrons and goes. And so you wind up with making a bromide as a, which can then be a nucleophile. So this is almost the same mechanism as, as hydrobromination, right? Except that then we had hydrobromic acid instead of just bromine. So but it's the exact same thing that's gonna ha that they proposed here, right? You, and then you wind up making a carbocation after you've attached your bromine to one side, and then your nucleophile could then come in here and attach. Is that a reasonable mechanism if they're only seeing anti-addition? Why not, Casey? Uh, because 
that Carbo cation can be attacked both ways, front and back attack. Exactly. If it went through this mechanism, then our bromide at the end could go from attack from up top or bottom, right? So we shouldn't see any stereo specificity. We shouldn't only see anti-addition if it actually went through this mechanism. We should see a mixture 50-50, maybe favoring one side um, based on sterics, but at the very least, we should see some of both, the sin and the anti, if this was the mechanism. So, and, and this is the same logic they used to figure out most of these mechanisms. A lot of these mechanisms were figured out before they knew most of quantum. They didn't know very much about orbitals. They just knew that these things, that these carbocations were planar. And they just looked at the experimental results and said, well, we only get anti-addition. Therefore, it can't be this mechanism. So it's, and I'm sure you guys have noticed if you've had physics, um, that physics experiments versus chemistry experiments, physics experiments tend to be a lot more direct in terms of, hey, we can measure this. And so you measure it and it either matches what you expect or it doesn't versus chemistry where you have to go through three layers of logic in order to get to what did my experiment actually mean. Um, and that's, Part of that is because we can't physically see these molecules, right? So we have to be able to think about the consequences. What does this mean as far as what products should I expect? Um, which is tricky. And what this class is about is giving you practice with that. So if we did, and this is exactly what we were just saying, if it went through this mechanism, we should see sin and anti maybe favoring anti because then it gets, you know, because this big bromine is out of the way then, but we should see at least some of the sin addition and we see none of it. Um, so what we actually have is we wind up with this, this kind of looks like that, um, the mechanism for the mercury, for the oxymercuration, where the first step was you took that mercury and you kind of made this three-sided ring where the mercury was basically stuck to the pi bond and it kind of rearranged the, the electrons to be in this triangular shape. Um, so, the, but you do wind up, we lose one of the bromines as a bromide and the bromine that's left though, instead of just attaching to one of the two carbons, actually kind of attaches to both at the same time. It's a big enough atom it physically takes up enough space, it can be close to both sides at the same time, which means that you can have a covalent bond to both carbons at the same time, right? Because that's, that's all governed by how physically close things are. That's, if think atoms are physically close together, you can have electrons in both valences at the same time. Um, and so then we wind up with a bromine with a negative charge on it, but at least everything has a full valence still. So this is more stable than making the carbocation. And this bromonium ion um, winds up being a, um, a similar, we'll see similar mechanisms a lot of times. If you have something that's much bigger than the carbons that can share electrons, we wind up seeing similar mechanisms. Um, but this was one of the first that they discovered. And um, my my own OCHEM instructor from college actually was in the research group that did this. He was the first author on one of these papers that first showed that this is what happens. Um, but then all of a sudden, this, this does make sense in terms of only seeing the anti-addition though, right? Um, because he wind, you wind up with this, you have to attach to the far side with your second bromine because this bromine is not just kind of in the way, it's like directly in the way if you try to do a sin addition. So the second step here is once you make this bromonium ion, the second step is, okay, well, one of the, the bromine that's already attached takes one of the pairs of electrons when your bromide comes in and attaches to the other side. So you will only ever get, and that's, a, that's an SN2 mechanism, basically. Your leaving group leaves at the same time that your nucleophile comes in. 
right? And so we always will get the trans product for, for bromination. Um, and this is one of those mechanisms that you should be hoping shows up on a test, right? Because it's only two steps. It's short, doesn't take up that much space. You don't have any random things coming in. It's not a multi, you know, you don't have H2O2 plus NaOH showing up halfway through and disrupting things. Um, and it's very predictable in the way that it always makes the same thing. Your bromines always have to be facing opposite directions. And sometimes that won't matter. It only matters if we have stereochemistry involved. Um, and but with ring structures, especially, it makes a makes a difference because they're always going to be on opposite sides of the ring. And if the second step here was just a nucleophilic attack that just goes through an SN2, well, we got lots of practice last quarter with you can do an SN2 with pretty much any nucleophile you want, right? Um, and so we actually wind up seeing that you can mix and match these a little bit. You don't have to have the just, you know, two bromines attached. You can make what's called a halohydrin, um, which sounds like a, a bad guy from a Captain America movie. Um, halohydrins are just the same thing. You break your pi bond, you attach one thing to each side, and in this case, you wind up adding the bromine to one side or to, and making that bromonium ion. And then instead of having bromide act as your nucleophile for step two, if there's any water around, water can act as your nucleophile for step two. Right, so, but it's the exact same mechanism. And then, However, if it's not going to be symmetrical, if we're going to add a bromine to one side and an OH to the other side, we do need to know which of these gets the oxygen and which gets the bromine. And it kind of follows Markovnikov's rule. We're going to add that the nucleophile that gets added second goes to the more substituted carbon. Right? And because and the mechanism kind of shows why this would be the case. The first step when making the bromonium is the same as with bromine. However, when you come in with the oxygen and the oxygen attaches, it has to pick one of these two carbons, right, to attack. It's always going to pick the more substituted of the two carbons because that means you, you're breaking the weaker bond. It's easier to break the bond on the side that's more substituted because um, because that means we don't have a transition state that looks that looks like a um, primary carbocation. You're never going to break this bond. That's never going to happen. You're never going to have the oxygen attack the less substituted carbon here. It's always going to go to, so that's not, I didn't even know I could do that. Um, it's always going to go to the more substituted carbon because this bond is easier to break the bond between the bromine and the more substituted carbon is weaker. And it could be partly due to sterics, but mostly just due to the fact that if you break the bromine bond to the more substituted carbon, you would be making a carbocation that's tertiary as opposed to primary. Right? And since the transition state, you do have to break that bond, you're gonna break the bond to the more substituted carbon. So let's practice with these. Let's recap. If we start with one methylcyclopentene, I'll give you guys a few minutes and then I'll go through and recap the most important part of each of these. 
All right. So I kind of went through and put key aspects to, of both of these, uh, or sorry, of all of these reactions. And the main thing is, is it Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? And it, then since it's a ring structure and there's some stereochemistry involved, we need to know sin or anti. Right, so for the hydroboration oxid followed by oxidation, it's anti-Markovnikov, and we only get the syn isomer. So that means that we're adding an OH group and a hydrogen to the same side of the molecule. The oxygen and the methyl group are going to be on opposite carbons. and facing opposite directions, right? So we're adding, our oxygen has to be on the less substituted carbon. And it's syn addition. That means that the oxygen and the hydrogen that are added have to be in the same direction, right? Because we're adding The other thing that we're adding to the other side of the molecule is this hydrogen. So the hydrogen and the oxygen have to be facing the same direction, which means that the methyl group that was already there has to be opposite of the OH. And since this one kind of looks funky with it being out of position like that. And so this would be our product plus an antimer. I have no idea what my neighbor opened in their backyard, but it was, seems to have been covered. You know, furniture or something gets shipped and it's wrapped in, in the really thick layer of like cellophane. It looks like really, you know, saran wrap basically. It's like a easy chair worth of cellophane blowing around in my backyard from my neighbor's yard. At least I'm assuming it's from my neighbor's yard because it's not from mine. So, sorry, I, I get distracted easily. I'm like that guy from uh, American Beauty. I feel like I should get the video camera out. Now, is that too old of a reference? Kevin Spacey movies have not aged well, have they? Um, anyway. That's neither here nor there. So let's go back to our starting molecule. If we're just doing acid catalyzed chlorination, it's Markovnikov, right? And it goes through that carbocation intermediate that's totally planar. So that means we're going to get anti and syn. And it doesn't really make a difference in this one anyway, because it's Markovnikov. We're already going to be adding our chlorine to the more substituted carbon. So it doesn't really matter if the chlorine's up and the carbon is down and the methyl group is down, because that'd give us the same molecules if we flipped it, right? So no stereochemistry here, only one product. We do still want to pay attention to the sin versus anti, the fact that this is anti and sin, because if it was a more complicated molecule, let's say it was that molecule, this is going to have an enantiomer. And then we have to say plus en, because we'd wind up with, if we could, if we had something like this, we could have those switched as well. So we do want to still be paying attention to anti versus sin addition, but it doesn't make a difference in this case. We get only one molecule here. As far as hydrogenation, this one is going to make a is that going to make a difference? We're, we're taking this and we're going to add a hydrogen to both sides, to the same side of the molecule. Not really, right? We're going to get methyl cyclopentane regardless. 
Not R. It doesn't won't make a difference. It's R. And again, we want to pay attention that it's sin because if there is other stuff on this ring, it's going to affect whether we make the the cis versus the trans isomer. But for this molecule, that's our product for hydrogenation. It's methyl cyclopentane. Break the pi bond out of hydrogen to both sides. If we have Markovnikov and then anti-addition, again, the fact that it's Markovnikov means we're going to be adding our OH group to the more substituted carbon, right? If we're adding our OH group to the more substituted carbon, we have the only two things attached to this ring structure at the end are both on the same carbon. So we're not going to get an R versus an S. In this case, our product would just be the alcohol attached there. And then, last but not least, the halo hydrin formation. The halo hydrin formation, I, I have it listed as kind of Markovnikov, um, because, and if if we define our Markovnikov reaction as being um, that whatever's added second goes to the more substituted carbon. This is still Markovnikov then, right? We just have to know the order of this reaction. We have to know that the first thing that happens is you attach a bromine and you break break the pi bond and you wind up making something that looks like this. There's that bromonium ion and broke that along the way too, so we don't have five bonds to a carbon. And because of that, these have to be facing the same direction. The bromine has to be either be above the ring or below the ring. It can't be on both sides of the ring at the same time, right? So there's that anti-addition. So we're going to wind up with this intermediate. And then our oxygen is going to come in here and Markovnikov-ish, the oxygen attaches to the more substituted carbon. So it's going to go through an SN2 reaction where our oxygen is going to come in here and attach from the, do a backside displacement, bromine takes those electrons with it. So we get that inversion happening. The methyl is pointed down, but then when the oxygen comes in and attaches, it flips that around. So that methyl group's, group's going to flip up like a light switch. And our oxygen gets attached below. So we wind up with this bond breaking and making a new bond here, which pushes the methyl group upward. And then if we're drawing the mechanism for this, we then have to finish it with the quick proton transfer to take that oxygen and deprotonate it so that you don't wind up with an oxygen with three bonds to it.
So proton transfer, poof, it's gone. And so, Casey. Yeah, I was going to ask. Um, so, is it going to end up with orientation wise that the bromine and the methyl are the same orientation and the bromine just stays as soon as they attach? Exactly. The bromine winds up being cis relative to the methyl because the oxygen added in the anti configuration. So back to the question somebody had earlier about um, how do we know if it was sin, if it's sin or anti, a chunk of it is knowing the mechanism. Um, you could go through and you could memorize which of these is sin and which of these is anti, but it's a lot easier in most of these cases if you know what the intermediate looks like. Because if you know that the intermediate is that bromonium ion, that makes it really easy to say, oh, well, the oxygen has to come from the opposite side then. Um, and same with the hydroboration and the oxymercuration are more complicated mechanisms, but it's the same thing. If you know that the oxymercuration goes through an intermediate that looks a lot like the bromonium ion, then our oxygen that's going to come in after that has to attach to the other side. And... We will end there, although we were one, one slide short, Casey, of getting to peroxy acids that you asked about. Um, this is going to be what we'll start with on Thursday, but this is how you make an epoxide. And if, you, if epoxide sounds somewhat familiar, that's actually where the word epoxy comes from. An epoxy is an epoxide in one of those little containers that you mix together, and it's a the other reactant in the separate container when you mix them together you wind up breaking the epoxide bond that looks kind of like the bromonium ion and attaching a bunch of stuff together to make one giant molecule basically is what an epoxy is which is why they're so stable and so hard to clean up and so durable um and it just but to make the epoxide you start with the alkene and you expose it to what's called a peroxy acid where you have the oxygen oxygen single bond that we saw before which is just super unstable to the point you can make a three-sided ring structure with an oxygen. And we'll cover all this again. I just wanted to, to mention, um, we're going to keep going with these triangular ring or these triangular three-sided rings um, because they're stable enough to be an intermediate, but they're not that stable, which means that they're, they happen on our way to a lot of different products. Um, and so the, the other, the next step then would be a ring opening. And that's what an epoxy is when you mix the two tubes, you're doing a ring opening reaction, which is not necessarily to make a diol like this. Anyway, um, we'll end there. And...